Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, that the hall is still full is a good sign that everybody is waiting to hear Mr. Jaydev Ranade. And my job is to just ask him the questions and the, uh, then you will hear his wisdom on uh, where China is today. So let me begin by um, you know, asking, in fact, uh, one latest update. Uh, President Putin, after winning the so-called election or selection, uh, has just said that China and Russia will get much more closer than they have ever been uh, in, in the coming years. That itself is a good starting point, I thought. So I want you to uh, tell us a little bit about the major power relations. And when I say major power in our context, it's uh, China, Russia, China, US, and uh, India, China. Uh, where are these relationships right now and what is the uh, interplay between these three relationships really? Uh, thank you, Nitin. <clears throat> uh, I'm aware of uh, Putin's remark just after his uh, victory in the elections. I'll just uh, take you back to the various statements that Putin has made. And in fact, the statements talking about, shall I say, the solidity of China-Russia relations have by and large emanated from Moscow, from Putin. Uh, Xi Jinping, of course, has made a lot of investment in his relationship with Putin and with Russia in that order. But it is Putin who has been really uh, belaboring the point that China and Russia are very close. I think it is in Russia's interest and they want to keep this, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, relationship going uh, in their own self-interest, both of them. And the reason is that the Americans uh, have put China under a lot of pressure, have put Russia under a lot of pressure, and they both feel that this is a the time they can maybe try and um, debilitate the United States. And uh, that is their intent. Uh, let me uh, just look at um, how this war in Ukraine started. And at that time, the general feeling was that um, Russia will make short work of Ukraine, etc. It was not able to uh, in that shorter time. But that doesn't mean that uh, the war is over or that the Russians have given up. I think they're used to uh, wars of attrition, grinding battles in history, and uh, they're prepared for that. I think that's an example of Chinese sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> so someone in here is on the payroll. <laughs> so you can see the deep inroads. Deep, deep inroads. <laughs> so as I was saying, the um, uh, Chinese are, of course, pushing uh, the same line, but they have been a bit reticent. Right. Because there are suspicions in China about Russia, what the end objective is. But that's suspicion among Chinese strategists. As far as Xi Jinping is concerned, he sees that this is a good time to uh, build the relationship and he has put an investment into Putin. Putin also feels the same way, that he can bring China closer in order to form, if I may use a kind of a joint front. And here I'll make a remark which uh, people may contest. But in essence, despite the changes that have happened in China and in uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, they are not really capitalist. They are, in essence, both the leaders are hardcore communists. They have grown up there and that is one of the binding factors between the two. As far as the United but States… Just, just sorry, to stop yeah. you there, can we ignore their history of hostility and um, tense relationship? Even if it was in the late 60s and early 70s, China, Russia, have they overcome that uh, mutual suspicion? That is exactly why I said this relationship is between the two leaders. As far as the strategic communities are concerned in China and in Russia, and in China to some extent the population, they are suspicious of the Russians and vice versa. Which is why in a lot of Chinese military writings, they say that the Russians are not willing to give them the latest generation technology, etc. And we find that instances like, for example, an anniversary of Vladivostok, you know, the Chinese came out with all kinds of statements. Also, in a very important article 
in the Wen Wei Pao, which is a Chinese-owned newspaper published out of Hong Kong. They spoke about the five wars that China must fight in the nice next 50 years. The last war was with Russia. That's right. So uh, these indicators are still around. And before you dismiss that Wen Wei Pao article, I mean, I studied it very closely. Uh, I can't say that it was written by a military leader, mm -hmm. but certainly the language is as if it was either a military man who has sort of dictated it, right. or it was a journalist who overheard a conversation between the military people and wrote it. Uh, that is the kind of uh, language that uh, um, it seemed to contain. So I feel, and um, I found that a lot of countries in uh, East Asia uh, took a lot of note mm -hmm. of that particular article. But also, in, uh, on the other hand, in Russia, and this is what one hears from uh, friends there or, uh, you know, in their, some of their writings, that uh, China's dominance or China's inroads into Far East in Russia uh, is not liked by uh, the Russian population, like you, you already mentioned that. Even the strategic community there does not like it. So is that something that uh, they have to keep in mind uh, as leaders, that uh, it's only a leader-to-leader uh, -leader contact and not so much people-to-people -people, uh, connect between the two? Yes, uh, definitely in the long term, as we proceed further, it will lead to serious tensions. But right now, the Russians also need uh, the Chinese. They need Chinese capital. And the Chinese are supplying a lot of consumer goods to the Russian Far East, uh, saving Moscow the trouble of exporting those or sending those uh, consumer goods to the East. So it suits the Russians, it suits them. And I think when the time comes, um, there will be friction. But I would say the United States is a big player here. Uh, they have to play their game and try and see and hear uh, if they can bring about a wedge between the two instead of looking at both as, you know, uh, adversaries. Mm. Uh, it is something that uh, they need to do. Because if the two uh, form a joint front, it will make it that much more difficult for the Americans to uh, contain the Chinese. And uh, of course, they say they don't want to, but I don't believe that. But that will also be a problem for India, if the Russians and the Chinese get together. Definitely. And that's why, that's why the China's rise is actually having implications not just on the China-US relations or China-Russia relations, but also on India-China relations and India-US relations. So in that context, how do you see, how do you, how do you keep the Russians and the Chinese apart or just keep them transactional? Well, the first and the simplest thing is of course to reduce the pressure on Moscow and uh, try and, uh, you know, uh, make some gestures or try and uh, deal with them in a manner that they are not under that much pressure and separate them from the Chinese. As far as we are concerned, we are keeping our, um, you know, avenues open to Russia despite uh, the Western pressure. And here I will digress a bit and uh, at least share with you my view, my assessment is that the real contest is actually between the United States and China. It's not Absolutely. between the US and Russia, though sure. a lot of American strategists say that. Yeah. I think it's between these two. China has the wealth, it has the military capacity, it has the ambition and they have declared it. Right. And they've put a deadline on it. Now, can the Americans move in enough time to contain the Chinese or not is the question. And uh, that brings me to the point that um, will the Americans be willing to be number two, number three or number four and be dictated to by the Chinese? I don't see that. So for that, they have to do something. And here I feel the situation can become uh, even more volatile leading probably to a conflagration and I would say the, if you ask me to give a timeline, I'd say between three to five years is a hot time that we're looking That's at. quite grim. That's quite grim. But could it be only on Taiwan or it could be on any other issue? Well, it could be Taiwan, it could be the South China Sea somewhere. I mean, let's paint a scenario. I mean, since we are doing that, uh, let's say an American warship bumps into a Chinese ship. Given the internal situation in China today, uh, what will Xi Jinping do? the amount of nationalism he's pumped into the people in China will compel him to react. Right. And uh, I'm sure the PLA at that time will probably say we are not, you know, fully ready, uh, but uh, he will have little choice. So he'll either have to take some pyrrhic gesture and try and do something, or otherwise he'll just have to keep quiet, which means that he's a paper tiger. 
So that is the dilemma that uh, so China. Will there be. is a counter question. I know that there are uh, there are people from the uh, American uh, embassy here. Uh, I want to be a little provocative. If you look at the history of uh, South China Sea and the militarization of South China Sea, the building of the islands there, America and its allies kept saying uh, this is not acceptable. Freedom of navigation patrols. We'll do this. We'll do that. But they never went beyond a point, and the Chinese kept on doing what they needed to do. So does America have a stomach to take on the Chinese if they go beyond the red line and what that red line could be? That is exactly the question that Xi Jinping is asking. <laughs> uh, whether, and he is watching the Americans, whether they are willing to step uh, up or not. And I think everyone is watching whether uh, the Americans are going to do anything. South China Sea, I think to a large extent, the Chinese have uh, come to a position where they are in near control or almost uh, total control of South China Sea. Uh, they have engaged in all kinds of activities there. Uh, they built airstrips, they've created exactly. islands. So they, they're there and no one has done anything about exactly. it. They're threatening the Philippines, you know, over that ship which Absolutely. is down. Again there, there has been no reaction except maybe a statement once in a while. Yeah. They have challenged the Japanese to an extent, not fully, but at least to a point. So they're doing all these, laying out markers, if I may say. But um, uh, Xi Jinping is watching what the Americans will do. And uh, uh, I th as I said, I, I look at a certain timeline, and that is the timeline within, within which the Americans also have to react. Otherwise, they would find that the Chinese have stolen a march. Yeah, so taking that timeline into consideration, can that same timeline be juxtaposed in the context of India-China border tensions? Will Xi Jinping attempt, if that is not feasible or that's not happening, if he's not confident enough, is the next target, is the next target then or the next possible target is uh, the Indian border where you can do something and uh, get away with it is what he thinks or I think, or would he have changed his mind going by what has happened in the last four years where we uh, immediately mirrored the deployment and stood firm despite all the provocations, uh, the uh, deployment continues. What is your prognosis on that? Uh, if we look at the internal situation in China, the economic situation is, I would say, near to grim. Um, the people are very unhappy. The economy has slowed down. Businesses are shutting. And um, uh, he's, he has not made any substantive moves to revive the economy. There is no stimulus given. So there are a lot of problems there. The people are disappointed and uh, they are discontented, including within the party. Now, that is the situation where he might resort to some kind of adventurism outside, which is what brings India into the equation, India or Taiwan. India seems to be an easier option because we don't have any treaty, uh, treaty agreement with anyone. But at the same time, um, let's not forget what happened in Doklam. Yeah. There were 73 days, we held them off. That's right. And finally, uh, there was a mutual withdrawal. I think what they did in April 2020 was frankly a strategic miscalculation on the part of the Chinese. They've upset and annoyed the biggest power on their border with whom they have an unsettled border. Uh, they could have had a friendly equation with us. Prime Minister Modi reached out a number of times. Now I think that phase is over. We fact, are going to be extremely suspicious. Yeah, in fact, we, I'll go a step further and say that was a tactical operation which has strategic implications in, the, in, a, in a sense that the entire Indian population has now become the adversary of China. Earlier, I think our Indian obsession or Indian elite's obsession with Pakistan has thankfully uh, dissipated and has come uh, to put attention on China, which I think the Chinese wouldn't like really because now you're countering Chinese uh, perfidy, Chinese attempts, misadventures, wherever possible, which I think was not the case, say, a decade ago. But by doing this, probably they have uh, turned that advantage into a disadvantage for themselves. Would you agree? Absolutely. That's why I said it's a strategic miscalculation. Yeah. They have lost the Indian population. As far as Indians are concerned, they have no trust in the Chinese now. Uh, we are countering them in uh, the economic area. I mean, we are trying to uh, reduce our dependence on the Chinese, which had gone to, I think, uh, unhealthy proportions. Uh, it will take us time, but we are at least on the path. We are trying to prepare ourselves on the borders and at sea. Uh, we're trying to build strong relationships. So I think uh, I don't see a period where if the Chinese expect we are going to give concessions, I don't see that happening. Uh, we are willing to talk. 
but I don't think we are willing to uh, negotiate concessions. Um, they will have to pull back. Whether they can pull back, I don't know. Otherwise, we'll have this situation, um, frozen hostility, if you want to call it. Yes. And uh, um, I think we are quite prepared to stick with it. They are having problems. They are having difficulties in recruitment. They've raised the recruitment age of their uh, conscripts whom they're taking. Um, they have uh, started targeting the minorities, ethnic minorities, so Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongols, they're trying to recruit them, there's discontent there. So all this is also going on and we know the state of their army, the amount of corruption, etc. there. So uh, I think they're also finding it difficult. So I'll come back to uh, India-China tensions or India-China relationship going through this phase a little later. Going back to uh, US-China, which is right now the most consequential relationship for the globe in a, in a context of global disorder that one is talking about. Um, it's tense uh, from whatever statements that we see. Americans have tried to reach out to the Chinese. The American businesses have said that uh, let's go back to the old days, but that's not happening because uh, decoupling is, uh, I think, the stated aim in, China, in America. And of course, the technology denial uh, regime has been put in place, especially on semiconductors and others. How would Chinese now tackle this aspect? Have they uh, overreached themselves much earlier than they would have liked to have done? Because we are talking about rise of China and whether they can meet their strategic ambitions. And those three aims that they had, three objectives by 2049, are they on track or have they now uh, veered off the path really, if, if I can say that? I think their ambition remains intact. That by 2049, they want to either be equal to or surpass the United States. That, that remains. But their uh, ambition to reach a certain technological level by 2025, I think that has slipped by a minimum of five to 10 years because uh, they now have to start um, uh, manufacturing that kind of chips, etc. And here, if I may just digress a bit, we are seeing the bluff that worked all the way up in the Chinese system. When the Americans imposed those uh, sanctions, um, immediately after the party congress, then the, um, in fact, Trump was the one who did it. The um, Chinese reaction was that, oh, we are ready, we, we've got enough chips, we can uh, catch up, etc. But we find that even now they're struggling and at a much lower level. So I think that is going to take them a lot of time. Uh, the second is the market that they had captured, thanks to their advantage in these areas, is going to suffer. Uh, along with that, the Americans have also started reducing the imports from the Chinese. The figures that came out uh, this year, earlier this year, uh, showed a 20% drop. Now, that is the wealthiest market that the Chinese had, the next being Europe. Now, if they lose those two, or if the uh, comes exports down. drop, comes down, yeah. then they have to look to India, which is the largest untapped market in the world today. And we are trying to uh, reduce our dependence on the Chinese. So I think they're in a hard place and uh, the economy will hurt them increasingly and there will be a um, comparative rise in the discontent in China because of the uh, economic slowdown. And uh, that will create probably tensions within the Chinese Communist Party. So talking about, uh, since you mentioned uh, Trump, uh, all indications are that he's the front runner, if not the winner outright. We can't say elections can never be predicted uh, conclusively. But uh, in case he's the front runner and if he comes to the White House in January 2025, um, how would he uh, so lay out his policies on China? W what's your prognosis? Well, I think he's unpredictable, so one doesn't know. <laughs> but uh, going by the past, uh, I think he will um, be tough on China. And um, at least the advisors who were there earlier, if they still have uh, influence with him, uh, will push for increased uh, toughness with China. Uh, that's my suspicion. And uh, he would be only too happy to go along with it. The Chinese will try and strike deals with him. Um, I don't know whether they will succeed. But I think as far as the Americans are concerned, their strategic community will push hard for trying to um, contain uh, the Chinese rise. Talking about Europe, Europe itself is, I think, um, in a very weak state right now. Uh, given what has happened in the Ukraine war and now uh, their economy is not doing too well, interest rates have risen. So uh, if their purchasing power, like what you mentioned, if the Chinese can't get that market or returns from that market, 
uh, what do they do? I mean, India, again, is now putting non-tariff barriers, tariff barriers is not yet in place. But uh, Huawei being banned from 5G, ZTE not being allowed. Where do the Chinese look for and what is the tweak that they must do in their economic model? Uh, unemployment is rising uh, in, in, within uh, China. So how do you foresee that uh, Xi Jinping uh, will be able to tackle this? And will this mean a larger opposition, a stronger opposition to him within? Definitely. Unless the economy picks up, I think um, the level of discontent will rise. Uh, let me just give you a, a small point here. The uh, provinces have been told that uh, they cannot have any more land sales, which means uh, almost 40% of their revenues are, uh, disappear because that's what they used to earn. The uh, salaries mm -hmm. of government employees in the provinces has already been cut by about 30% plus. Bonuses given to them have been withdrawn. Now that's obviously adding to the pool of discontent that exists. Factories have shut down. A lot of the workers who went uh, back to their villages at time of COVID, the majority have not returned. So, you know, things are uh, pretty bad. Within the Communist Party itself, and I think that's important because what happens to the people is one thing, but when it starts hurting you closer to home, it's right. different. The, within the Communist Party, there is growing uh, apprehension that the relationships with US have been mishandled and it could result in sanctions against China. And uh, in my view, the, if that happens, the Chinese will hurt far, far more than what the Russians have hurt. The Chinese, not only are they psychologically um, attuned to having uh, you know, multinationals in China, sure. etc., cetera, but uh, they are an export-led economy. They're dependent on uh, exports to the West, and that will all get hurt. It will get upset. So I think that will be a body blow. But more importantly, uh, a large number of the over, over I would say, 70% uh, of the Chinese Communist Party cadres, their children are studying in the West, in the US, Australia, UK, etc., Europe. And if sanctions kick in, that means they'll have to come home immediately. All the money that these guys have kept outside, which is illegal money, will be confiscated by the governments there. Uh, that will hurt the Chinese no end. And uh, estimates that I saw um, uh, in Chinese, by Chinese, said almost, you know, over or nearly 200 million uh, Chinese will be affected. Mm -hmm. You know, their children, the relatives' children, etc., will have to come back. So I don't think the Chinese Communist Party will allow that. At that stage, they might tell Xi Jinping to pack it up. Oh, that's something that we'll have to watch out for. But also on a cultural and popular front, Americanization of the Chinese society is also complete in the last 40, 30, 40 years. So I think what you said is very relevant, that while the Russians didn't get so influenced or they didn't have so many businesses uh, from US uh, having manufacturing facilities in Russia, this is a fact uh, which is going to hurt the Chinese there. Yeah, let me just make a point <laughs> yeah. here. I mean, it's an ephemeral point, but yeah. uh, when you're talking about Americanization, uh, when you go to China, you find um, all the girls and the boys there, they're either Wendy or Diana That's or right. uh, Michael or yeah. whatever. Christian names. In, in India, we still uh, have our own names. We yeah. not switch. We have Hari and Dilip and yes, <laughs> Mohan. <laughs> yeah, we still have that. So that is a uh, completely different context civilizationally. Uh, but let me come back to now China, India, and that's, I think, uh, what we should look at uh, much more closely. Uh, having gone through this period of tension four years, uh, relatively uh, calmer borders right now and both sides, at least India is now improving its infrastructure on the border. Also, capability-wise, Indian armed forces are trying to reorient themselves to the wars of what we call the future new technology, deep technology is being uh, looked at, if not, uh, you know, uh, inducted. Uh, so, uh, going forward, and you have already mentioned five to ten years for, or three to five years for the America or US-China uh, configuration. Do you foresee any uh, large scale, uh, either invasion or attempted intrusion or a skirmish between Indian and Chinese forces uh, on the Himalayan border? And then we'll talk about the maritime thing. I think when the Chinese undertook what they did in April 2020, mm. in my view, it was part of a larger plan. Okay. And it was not just, you know, a minor intrusion. 
and our reaction our response our build up was unexpected mm -hmm. the speed of it was unexpected and the fact that we have stayed on there right and we are not yielded ground mm -hmm. i think um, uh, these things uh, they would have factored in mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they will not continue to push they would also look at it from the uh, as, as they they are uh, from the point of view that they put us under pressure as far as we are concerned we are used to that pressure by now right. in so many years so i think they might try um, some other adventure along the border it's a 4057 uh, km long border mm -hmm. they've uh, got a lot of troops in the east also in arunachal sure. and that area opposite arunachal yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so something can happen i also look at the uh, northern sector the depsang plains etc where the china pakistan economic corridors go uh, goes the chinese have a actual interest there substantive interest sure. uh, that also they will need to beef up mm -hmm. so we've got points where they can act but whether they'll act or not one doesn't know mm -hmm. i think if uh, xi jinping feels that the pressure on him is increased he might undertake that adventure but a lot depends on the state of the army itself and i do see a number of articles talking about the um, lack of discipline in the army the youngsters are not uh, you know uh, obedient to the party's dictates etc so all that is also there so whether the pla higher command feels it is okay or not uh, i'm not sure but i would certainly feel that um, there will be uh, actions along the border at various points scale of the actions i do not know but i expect within the next couple of years and maybe even you know as our elections come now <laughs> that's something that we have to really watch out for but th there is this counter view uh, which many people have expressed that if xi jinping has to do some misadventure against india he has to win decisively and today's uh, maybe may na, na, parity is not the correct word but uh, the state of affairs of both the militaries does not give him the luxury of a decisive victory uh, swiftly Uh, it may be long drawn or whatever we don't know what happens in long drawn wars nobody thought russia will take so long but um, do you think he will risk that kind of a uh, i mean if decisive victory is not obtained then it's a defeat in a way will he risk that well he's already in a way um, not been able to make headway after april 2020 and i would say the whole of asia is watching uh, as to what the chinese will do how the indians have held them back so his uh, whatever prepared boast that you know we've sorted india out the rest of you are nothing i think that's disappeared and um, uh, the next step is as you said uh, if he does something i think we, uh, we should be sanguine about the fact that even if we can uh, um, deliver uh, a minor blow uh, to him uh, a telling minor blow uh, he would have been defeated and um, i don't see Uh, uh major war uh, breaking out unless of course we go into much higher uh, you know it escalates escalatory much ladder yeah. that that goes one final question on the india china relationship uh, india also i mean chinese keep saying this uh, in conferences in their writings india is getting closer to the us and the west and quad they point out towards quad that you know india has gone there and it's a front against us asian nato constantly uh, those terms are used on the other hand uh, the quad partners tell india that you are not doing enough to pull your weight in the quad it's a no win situation for india what does india do in this context i think we should ignore both okay. i mean that's a great point the uh, <laughs> chinese are saying we got closer to the us etc to justify what they did yeah. my counter question would be why did you misbehave with us before we got closer to the us that's i mean the same thing absolutely going on. Yeah. similarly with the quad partners it's a question of trust i mean there are four of them I I'm not going to spell out things but I think uh, everyone is waiting for the other guy to take the lead <laughs> so why should we be the fall guy you know we are waiting for the others also and in any case india is the only country which has a 4000 km long disputed border with china yeah. not the other three exactly so i mean that's that's the point uh, that is there final i think we'll open up for the audience a uh, couple of questions but one final point from you i just wanted to uh, ask you about the uh, chinese uh, intelligence Uh, there have been books recently you have written number of times uh, others have written about it are they as effective as it's made out to be or uh, they are as as good or bad as any other uh, intelligence service well we have uh, a session or something on this uh, later okay. yeah, but like let me say yeah. that uh, when you look at um, as you said indian intelligence us intelligence we are generally looking at the agencies 
when we say Chinese intelligence, you have the Chinese Communist Party, which has its yes. own apparatus. Yeah, you have the United Front, which has its own apparatus. Right. You have the International Department. You have the Chinese Secret Service. You know, you have the Ministry of Public Security, sure. etc. So they've got a whole range mm. of things which they operate. Mm. And apart from the ac actual intelligence operations, their United Front Work Department and the International Department are also quite uh, lethal organizations. And uh, the United Front Work, for example, they infiltrate the um, journalists, the academic community, the students. I mean, there are various ways in which they do it. They give them incentives, financial incentives. Absolutely. They encourage them to visit China. They facilitate their visas. Mm. And when they come there, they uh, take care of all the travel arrangements, ask them to give a couple of talks, pay them handsomely. So there are various ways in which they operate. And by and large, when they come back, the, these guys change their view on China. Mm. And let me just end by saying that when uh, I spoke about students, they had a number of scholarships for okay. Indian students going there. Right. And uh, they, those uh, students spent four years. They were young, impressionable. When they came back, mm. by and large, they had the American, uh, the Chinese story, you know, not the Indian story, on whether it's 62 or whatever else. Right. So that is what they do. So when we look at their intelligence operations, we have to look at it on a much broader It's a wide, much more widespread net yeah. than uh, an influence operations is one of the key aspects of their warfare. Exactly. Uh, but we'll come to that. Uh, we have time for three questions, so we'll take Three bilateral relationship between the two countries, not as good as China-Russia. Uh, he also knows that he is closer to Putin. He's made much more investment. And uh, at the moment, I think both of them have a strategic interest in being closer to each other. So that is how I would look at it. Uh, if their relationship becomes closer, I think, which we are trying to uh, in insulate ourselves from, uh, then uh, we will know really uh, how Xi Jinping feels because I get the sense already that Xi Jinping is dominating Russia in the um, groupings where they are working together, like the South China, uh, like the SEO, SEO. like the BRICS, BRICS. etc. It is China which is dominant, uh, not Russia, which is a change in um, you know their inter, shall I say, in their bilateral relationship. But it's something that suits uh, both of them at the moment. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But I don't think when uh, it reaches that stage where Xi Jinping has to tell Putin that, you know, steer clear of India or be careful of India, I don't think it has reached that level. He's okay with uh, the present state of ties between the two of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, I am Anachiketa Thakur from Symbiosis University. So my question is that when China is repeatedly raising diplomatic questions on Arunachal Pradesh or the so-called Sangnan, should India also raise similar diplomatic concerns over Tibet and Aksai Chin? Well, um, as far as Tibet is concerned, we have already made certain statements, but I think the, um, in the public perception, there is certainly a debate going on, on, on the Tibet issue. What should be our stand? Uh, let it remain there. I think we can uh, maybe um, try and introduce some, um, uh, shall I say, um, uh, questions or variables in that equation. But we've already taken a position. So I don't see us uh, changing that position. But on the other hand, I think uh, there are a number of other things that we can do to, um, uh, to, shall I say, strengthen our position on the Tibet issue. One very last question, Mr. Srinivas Soni. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you very much, Jade, for very insightful, insightful questions and very um, succinct and informed answers. My question is simple. There have been reports of tension between the leadership of the PLA and the le apex leadership in China. And um, there have been reports of this nature in the Chinese media as well as in the international media. What do you make of it? Um, I've seen these uh, reports also, but uh, let me say that at least from what I've seen, there is no, uh, I'm, I would not infer that there is a tension between the senior leadership of the PLA and the senior Chinese Communist Party leadership. That's the first point I'd make. The second is that there is, at the same time, there is 
either discontent or unhappiness within the PLA, in the officer corps, uh, with the number of officers who have been dismissed on charges of corruption, either made up or uh, real. Uh, made up, I say, because when the loyalty is doubtful, also they have been punished and removed. And uh, by 2016, 40% of the officer corps was removed. So obviously that has generated a lot of uh, discontent and unhappiness. But on the other side, Xi Jinping has also been promoting uh, younger officers, his own people, uh, in the, in the uh, PLA. So I would say that the PLA is probably, um, um, you know, a bit um, not sure of itself. Uh, the massive changes that uh, he has uh, brought in, old, uh, uh, if I may say, traditions, old loyalties as far as the regiments, etc. are concerned, group armies are concerned, have been uh, destroyed. Uh, so there, are, there is a lot of change, but whether that leads to discontent, I'm not sure. But I will say, maybe it's a pointer, that there have been consecutive, year-long political education campaigns in the PLA for the last few years. Consecutive. So there has been no relief for the uh, PLA officers who are spending almost 30 to 40 percent of their time per day studying ideological literature political uh, education uh, literature. And um, the other point I would make is that um, there are quite often articles in the PLA Daily and other military websites saying that the younger officers are not uh, as obedient or as disciplined, as obedient to uh, what they call absolutely lo absolute loyalty to the party as the senior members are. So maybe that also indicates some, uh, shall I say, turbulence within the PLA. But I don't know whether we would say it's discontent at the higher level. Um, uh, that we'll see. But as I said, these are the indicators that we have. Yeah, we'll have to go and uh, look at the uh, literature more de in more detail like you keep doing. And over a longer time. And over, over a longer, longer time. time, yeah, that's true. But uh, that's some uh, good note to, on which to end our conversation. Thank you very much for your insights and your time and thank you audience for being very patient listeners and informed questions from the, those who ask the questions. Thank you very much.